All right, welcome. This is the ABEM LLSA 2013. This is our 10th year, the 10th year for all of you out there taking these LLSA tests and our 10th year for doing this. 10th time together. I don't know how Di has put up with me 10 times, but uh, that just shows it's a desperate world out there. <laughs> um, and I recently, I had to take my exam and, and just before I went to it, I went, what do you, you mean? Did. I got, I I got you L exam. Yeah, no, I got, I was like, I have LLSA things out outstanding. I'm like, of Isn't all people, that I of all people. So yeah. take it, take it to heart. If you have, if you've postponed taking your LLSA exams, you have the man behind the screen who did the same thing for. <laughs> right. For this. So I tried to. I went to bang out three of them, and the first one I wrote, I failed. I was like, God damn it! What are the slides? <laughs> <laughs> so see, it's and, worth it. <laughs> now this year, there are actually only twelve <laughs> articles. This t ten years ago when we started this, there were something like twenty-one or a whole bunch, and they really yeah. culled it down over the years to a sort of a big meaty group, some meatier than others. Well, yeah, well, some some of these meatier are than others, and, and some, some, you know, not that we're the arbiters of what belongs in here or not, or not. we certainly aren't. Uh, but every once in a while, you look at the one that Diane's going to do first, for example, and you wonder, who thought that this was core emergency Well, you medicine? knew you're in trouble when you, they start with the 12 readings, include things from immune system disorder. So you know they have yeah. to reach to find those, and you know it's going to be a little bit problematic. But there also is musculoskeletal, which is a little bit more yeah. up our alley, some thoracorespiratory stuff, and then there's some miscellaneous that they threw in there, which yeah, are, there are a couple blast injury blast stuff. injuries. Those it's, are kind of nice. It's funny because I just, uh, for the abstracts course, of, um, I also... Um, just reviewed ATLS, and ATLS has a whole new emphasis on blast injuries, and obviously we've been uh, at war for a seemingly interminable amount of time, 10 years, 12 years, whatever it is, and we're seeing a lot of um, blast injuries from that venue, uh, but also they occur intermittently, right. scattered here so, and there. So all these make some sense. Now, there is one thing about how to use this video, if you're watching this. Um, we, do, we no longer reference the actual questions themselves because the test actually hasn't come out yet. So what we've done when we put these slides together is you'll notice at the end of each article are slides that have a little finger sort of pointing up. This finger, just like in that. case you... Because if yeah, it was me, it wouldn't finger. be the other, yes, it would be no, the other finger. But that would be go. Billy's finger. No, no, no. <laughs> this is a, a that kind of finger. finger. <laughs> uh, but basically, if you really want to cut to the chase, go to those slides. Those slides will hopefully have everything you need to, to, to quickly look at things to get answers to some of the questions. You may have to go back into the, into the actual body of the slides themselves in some of them because, again, we're not totally clairvoyant. But I think we've picked out most of what yeah. may be actually on the exam itself. If so, someone's in a particularly cantankerous mood when they were writing the yeah, questions, then we're in trouble. Maybe, they'll, maybe they'll have gone for more detail than that. Like the ones but, that you you didn't pass on the one the test you just Yeah. Closed. Well, no, no. It was just that it was a couple of years since I did it and didn't remember some of the stuff. <laughs> All right. So let's get started. What I recommend you do is pull up the sign on, do your little payment thing. In fact, you can get CME now. It's kind of nice. You, you can type get CME. In. You can get CME now for these, which is kind of nice. Die types like so, this. I type like this. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> pull them up, and either my recommendation would be to print them out, but at least have the screens up so that you can, as you go through, you can kind of pair up this and the actual, hopefully printed version of the question so that you can kind of get more sort of efficient at using this plus the actual test itself. So that being said, there you go. Ready? Let's start with number one. All right. Number one is infections in solid organ transplant recipients. No cringing allowed. There's a little bit cringeworthy here, but there are a few things that are actually helpful in this particular article. So this is by Fishman, and it came out in, in 2007. Um, this basically is focusing on what do we do with the people that come in with solid and organ it's transplants. it's a really complicated topic. It's It's broad. hugely complicated. Yeah. And the reality is a lot of the science of this is way beyond what we need to know as emergency physicians. But we do know certain things in our practices, depending where you practice, more more and more of these solid organ transplant recipients are coming in, liver transplants and kidney transplants and lung transplants, heart transplants are coming in. And when the challenge for us is, is sort of manifold. One is they, they, if they come in febrile, it may or may not be from an infection. We assume it's an infection, appropriately so. Yep. But it may be actually from rejection, which is the other big thing to kind of put in your list of things that are caused a, by fevers. They're on all these complicated drugs, and there's drug-related side effects. And if you assume it's infection, you just can't launch into the typical antibiotics because some of them are toxic. Some, yeah, some of them, they actually can't take these particular antibiotics. So they're also, if you miss it, if you decide to kind of dilly-dally, they, because they're immunosuppressed, may be rapidly you know, progress in their, in their infectious disease. So that's a problem. And it's crucial to kind of get the bug if you can. And some of the tests you send aren't sort of the routine deal that we do, things like viral cultures, for instance, right. or things that we don't routinely do. So it's a big challenge for us when a solid organ transplant person comes in. I guess the other thing I would say about this is, is that the other thing that happens with these people is obviously they're complica complicated. They have high medical costs over the period of time where they're, they're dealing with all of this. And not surprisingly, some of them lose their insurance and end up disproportionately in the safety net. 
uh, which right. is us. So, everybody, so there you go. You see them no matter where you work. And, and one of the things about the infections, if they do get an infection, is they kind of fall into four broad categories. One is the ones that come from the donor. Some are actually from the recipient. Some happen because they're in the hospital. And then some just happen because they're out in the community. And each of these is a little bit different. For instance, in donor-derived infections, meaning that the, the organ comes from someone who has things like CMV, TB, or trypanosomiasis, which are latent infections. They may actually be minimally, if at all, symptomatic from those. Right, but once Chagas that hangs around right, for decades. Once so that organ gets transplanted into somebody who then gets immunosuppressed, then it becomes a problem. Or they may be actively infected at the time of the, tr of the organ donation, viremic, bacteremic. They picked up something while they were sick in the hospital as they were becoming an organ donor. Um, and often organ those organs. Organ recipient, we hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the donor end of it. Yeah, this yeah, is the donor, donor side getting end. sick. Yeah. And then the organisms themselves, when they get them, the resistance is often a problem. And so it, it, the donor, him or herself, is, is already a potential source of issues. And because the, the recipients are immunosuppressed, those infections may get transferred to that recipient in the organ that they get. But that recipient, because they're immunosuppressed, may not develop the symptoms an immunocompetent person would. Correct. So they may be a little bit altered. They may have bump in their LFTs. That's the only sign that you have that they've picked up some sort of infection from that donor. The other kind of problem with this is the donor, that you have a limited amount of time to, to right, get so those organs. So they can't do an incredible amount of screening. They can't do tons of testing. So this may be a problem in some of the donor sort of sources of infection. So, for example, you mentioned Chagas disease and trypanosomiasis. So the only country that screens their blood supply, for example, for, for Chagas is Peru, where they have a very a much higher incidence of it. And there was actually a paper some time ago done at, at L.A. County that looked at whether or not our blood supply has Chagas in it, and it does. Well, but you guys have a low, a, even a clinic, at, yeah, right? At, at a, a, but at a low rate, not to, not high, quite mm -hmm. high enough to justify screening for it. But that same low rate of Chagas disease is going to be present in donors mm -hmm. of organs and may transmit it. Exactly, exactly. Now, some infections, they will not let you be a donor. HIV is one. If you're floridly septic, you just don't get to be a donor. But interesting, Chagas disease doesn't preclude your being a, a donor. If you're seropositive for Chagas disease, you can still give your liver. Yeah, for a kidney um, or liver, makes sense. Absolutely. HBV, same thing. Certain hepatitis C donors are allowed as well. So it, uh, it's a little bit dicey. And again, this is way beyond what we need to know ex as far as doing donations. But the reality is the donors themselves can be sources of kinds of infections. And then the recipient can also have an infection themselves before they get transplanted. So they may actually have an active infection like a pneumonia or something. Um, and preventing some of these infections is based a lot on what they do. So if you have a an organ, you know, somebody who needs to get a kidney and they love to travel around the world sort of in developing countries, they are at risk for having acquired all kinds of things that once they get immunosuppressed may become significantly problematic in just the recipient, him or herself. One of which is something like strongyloides. So yep. interestingly enough, and I didn't realize this, but strongyloides in somebody who is a, a, or a solid organ recipient turns out to be a potentially serious problem and it will basically recur. They end up with a hyperinfestation syndrome yep. which causes all kinds of issues um, and it is preventable and often prevented if they can get the person on pre-transplant medications. Right. But just this you is one of the... it's there or think about it. Exactly. And the same thing can happen. You can get hyperinfestation syndrome with strongyloides with HIV patients as well uh -huh. when they're very uh, immunosuppressed. So this is the same sort of scenario where if, if you get the strongyloides loose, then it runs wild. Exactly. Exactly. Now, the recipients also can have things that they have in their own bodies that they're able to sort of keep suppressed, that once they get immuno, or, or keep suppressed with the immunocompetent system, now we suppress their immune system, and they can have their own endemics, for instance, TB or histoplasmosis, recur, or basically end up with a, a, an activation of that in the recipient. So they are, then they're, they're half makes sense. Yep. They get immunosuppressed. They're twice as likely, or 50% times more likely to have that happen than you or I might. Then hepatitis C positive recipients, they can get reinfected. They affect, After liver transplants, they often do. And interestingly, HIV patients can receive organ transplants, which I didn't realize, but their medications don't preclude that. So HIV, if you have it, you can't give an organ, but if you have it, you might be able to receive an organ, which kind of adds a double whammy to the concerns for those of us in the ER. Right, and, and nowadays with HIV patients living so much longer, the numbers of them on organ potential lists. organ recipient lists is greater. Exactly. And they have some specific organ failures related to their HIV, like you know um, AIDS nephropathy, mm -hmm. for example, which might ultimately result in them needing a kidney. Right. 
Right. Now, the two other things that can happen infection-wise, not just donor-related or, or recipient-related, one is nosocomial infection. So if you're waiting for your kidney and you're in the hospital, you have a likelihood of picking up an, a hospital-acquired infection, which can be a disaster because it's often antibiotic-resistant. And then community infections, you just happen to be around, you know, you're not immunocompetent, but you're around somebody who brings an infection to you. That also is an issue. So infections sort of are four big categories. And as far as the organ recipient, him or herself, there's a thing called the net state of immunosuppression, a bunch of things that will contribute to your being immunosuppressed, the most common of which is what drugs you are on, which makes sense. They do and it to you dose, on purpose. their duration, Right, exactly, exactly. And there's, there are ways of trying to figure out what's the perfect sort of cocktail for you. How much should you get? How long should you get it? And there are sort of um, assays for this, but the reality is for us, immunosuppressive therapy, you have a, a renal transplant patient and they're on immunosuppressive therapy, that's the biggest factor as far as a net sort of immunosuppression. And that sounds like something that might be a really good question kind yep. of thing. So yep, I don't know I what agree. the questions are going to be, but that one sounds like a good one to me. Now, if they've gotten chemo, antibiotics, if they're a big one is if you have basically gotten a mucositis, you've broken down the most important thing, which is your skin or your mouth barrier to all the bugs that or live in Or your GI in barriers. On. Exactly. You chronic diarrhea. Exactly. That is a yep. huge problem as well. Then a sort of metabolic issues, et cetera. All of these things are what are called the net state of immunosuppression that make you prone to be picking up an infection if you're a transplant recipient. Now, we can prevent it. And I'll tell you, if you read about transplant science, it is remarkable what has happened. And they've gotten really good at sort of three major things that they know will, will prevent infections. Vaccination, prophylaxis, universal prophylaxis, and what's called preemptive therapy, which is kind of an interesting concept. Vaccination is critical. And organ recipients, people who are on organ donation lists, you're know, waiting to receive an, you know, a list, a, a, a organ, are given vaccines every year. They're given pneumococcal vaccines or um, influenza vaccines every year, pneumococcal vaccines every three to five years. That continues yep. after they actually receive that. And then certain vaccines, depending on their travel history, that it's very important that a recipient be kind of tuned up vaccine-wise because once you've received your organ and you get a vaccine, you're less likely to respond to that vaccine. Because you're immunosuppressed right. and, your and immune you can't get the live vaccines. Yep. So you're you're limited on what you can get. So vaccines hugely important in the pre-recipient, pre-received state of your of your getting your transplant. Lifestyle changes, washing your hands. We're all getting beaten to death with hand washing. But if you have a suppressed immune system, it's particularly important that you wash your hands. Gardening, be a little bit careful. You know, cleaning the litter box, be careful yeah, with the, that. The, don't get your toxo from the kitty. Exactly, exactly. People who are sick, wear a mask and go stay away from places where things like spores are going to get thrown in the air, like construction sites where histoplasmosis spores may be thrown in the air, well water, lake water, undercooked foods, all of that makes sense that lifestyle changes if you are Now is not the time for the unpasteurized French cheeses. Oh, exactly. It's not the time to have those particular e exposures to you. And then antimicrobials have turned out to be a huge, hugely important thing if you're a solid organ transplant recipient. So if you, for instance, if you're put on Bactrim, which, which is almost universal after you receive a solid organ transplant, there are a whole bunch of bugs that you will not get or you will not yep. at least manifest, things like pneumocystis or toxo. Antivirals are equally as important. So those kinds of agents will really be helpful in preventing you from, from either getting the infection itself or manifesting an infection that you may actually be brewing yourself And the body. antivirals are sort of also been in evolution because they're new agents and CMV, which we're gonna get to, is such a big problem It's here. a huge problem so. in this group. So, so the antivirals themselves, prevention of CMV and herpes virus is really, really key because not only is CMV a problem, it allows other of the virus, the herpes virus group, to come in and cause all kinds of trouble, including things like cancers. So we'll get into that in a minute. But prophylactically with these agents, you can prevent that at this big at-risk period um, for only a certain amount of time after you get your organ. And then, then you're at less of a risk because your immunosuppressive drugs yep. can be backed off. But it's really important. And this preemptive concept is that you, uh, for some of these things like CMV, rather than just give it uniformly to everyone, what they do in some cases is follow titers. They'll see that your titers for CMV start to go up, and that's when they'll go ahead and give you the antivirals themselves. So, so there's a concept different between sort of prophylaxis and pre em preemptive therapy with antiviral therapy. Now, because of all of this, what's happening is post-transplant patients are coming in very differently to us. 
post-transplant infections now are are different than they used to be. It was all these sort of immunocompromised state bad things. And it turns out it's not so much. And because they've suppressed a lot of these things, the patterns have changed. And what we worry about, and sort of these next few slides I think are pretty meaty as far as kind of questions and things to do with your practice. Yeah, and what to know about. What to is, know is about. time frame. Is timing. It's all time frame based. Timing. So if somebody comes in one month or less after their transplant, it's not the it's not an opportunistic infection. They're not immunosuppressed yet. They're just not there yet. But the donor who may have had CMV, you've now gotten their kidney, and you may be viremic or candidemic from that donor, or you were your own body was suppressing your own CMV, and now you are viremic because you now have, have basically released your own virus. Same thing would happen with HBV. Yeah. C. diff is very common, and that makes sense. They're giving antibiotics around the time of transplant. C. diff is very common. That makes complete sense. Yeah. And then abscesses, if you have trouble with the graft, they have trouble with the anastomosis, there's leaks, injuries, abscesses are a problem. They've, they've just cut you open. So there are a potential for abscesses, liver and lung in particular. So again, your skin and mucocutaneous barriers have been broken down in this case by the surgery. Right. So what we need to worry about is C. diff, viremia, candidemia, and graft-related problems. That's sort of the first month out there. From months one to six, if somebody comes in febrile, now it's usually viral or allograft rejection, which is something to remember. Somebody which will look febrile, might right. look like they have an infection. Exactly. And if you can so get it's a great if you mimic, can, but if you it's can not infectious. feel that kidney that's sitting down in somebody's felt pelvis and that kidney is tender, that gives you some sort of clue as to where you may be going with this. It's not usually a UTI because most people have been put on Bactrim, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, peri transplant. So it's not usually things like a UTI. It's not usually opportunistic infections. That will also suppress things like pneumocystis. So that doesn't usually happen. And the herpes viruses may be a problem at this point in time, that one to six months. So if somebody isn't on an antiviral at this point, that is something to consider. That they may have a herpes virus category infection. And then some of the other strange things like the fung fungi, aspergillus, and the strongylates, which we mentioned before, can occur at that point in time. So it's for us kind of the richest time of things to think about what might be causing somebody with a fever, including rejection and some of the stranger, um, the viral illnesses and some of the other sort of strange infections that can occur at that and, point in and, time. And I don't know how you feel about this, Di, but when I start seeing lists like this of diseases which I'm not as familiar with, right. what to me the take-home point is not as an EP, as emergency physician, is not that I'm going to learn all of these and learn their manifestations across the board or how they look in these patients. What it says to me is get help. Oh, exactly. Call exactly. ID. Call the transplant specialist that this water is deep and murky. Mm -hmm. Well, and it, there's so much at stake. There's a huge amount of stake here. So I think this is absolutely calling in the troops time. A, a transplant patient with a fever already, you're, you should have a very, your finger should be on the, on the dial, yeah. uh, dial button to call the, the specialists on this. Now, after six months, things are a little bit different. This is called the late post-transplant post period. And interestingly, your risk of infection decreases often because at that point in time, they've tapered your immunosuppression to a steady state sort of place. Your allograft is good. You're suppressed just enough to keep from rejecting anything. And now the and community now... pathogens start thinking, what exactly. do we got there? Where's the weak animal in the herd? Exactly. So now now you're back to sort of the, the other stuff. Now, a few things other that are sort of related to being a transplant recipient come up. HCV comes up. And there are certain malignant conditions, which including PTLD, which Billy and I were talking about earlier, post-transplantation lymphoproliferative disorder, which is something I'd never heard of before. Um, it can also occur at this point. We'll talk about that in a second as far as what that is. Um, what's really key is any potential sign of infection in somebody who is even at this point sort of minimal immunosuppression, you still have to be all over this thing to make sure they don't get sick. Now, yeah, what are the, the infections? This is not the time to think. Yeah, I think I'll punt them with follow-up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just a little virus, no big deal. How far could it get in 24 to 36 hours? <laughs> now, let's get to what the infections <coughs> actually are, the sort of common infections. And remember, they're actually not that common. They've gotten pretty good at keeping most of the stuff at bay. But CMV is a huge problem if you're a transplant recipient. It's across the board, I don't care if it's a bone marrow transplant, a solid organ transplant, it's just a huge problem. It does sort of two things. In, if it's the first year you've been exposed to CMV, it causes invasive disease. You get a fever, you get neutropenia, you get sort of total body things that go with a diffuse viral infection, thrombocytopenia. And you'll see that, that CBC on that patient with what you think of as a fever, a white count of three, right. you know, lymphopenia. a lot of lymph, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, not, not mostly polys. Right, you and know, thrombocytopenia is another yeah. one that will go with it as well. We'll exactly, there. exactly. And then what happens, unfortunately, with this is it sort of is a recruitment phenomenon because as your immune system is responding to CMV, it goes after the allograft. 
So you end up with L graft rejection as part of this as well. EBV is another big actor in that one. So EBV and CMV, it's kind of like the little brother kind of hangs on with this. EBV can be also sort of acquired with this or acquired from just walking and talking in the world because EBV is everywhere. CMV sort of opens the door to let EBV become a problem as well. And I'll just point out one that I just happen to have seen a couple of times. You know, you'll see this transplant patient and they end up in your eye room and your fast track with blurry vision and you're like, really? You know, so you, you're like, how did this end up in the fast track? Mm -hmm. And the your nurse like, well, vision. That's where the eye room is. And and so chorioretinitis is in there. Right, and, which looks and, like you know. it looks like spaghetti and meatballs. If you look in the back of somebody's eye who has CMV, it looks like yeah. spaghetti and meatballs back there. So that's Scramble what they look like. With Scramble eggs yeah. <laughs> the there other one. Now, the epidemiology, if they get this, it either can be the first time they've been infected and they don't have any antibody at all, or it's their own CMV that's reactivated, or it's this actual true super infection itself. So they've had it and now they're super infected. The primary infection is the most serious. I, I have no antibody. I receive an allograft from somebody who had HCV that was latently, infe latent latently infected and now I get sick. Now, most of those people will just get viremic and then seroconvert. Some of them get very sick at that yeah. point in time. So that's the group that's the, the most concerning as far as the invasive infection. What they've done with this is prevent this. Okay, it's either prophylactic, like I talked about, where you, they just give the antivirals, or preempt, preemptive, where they watch the anti this, this sort of serology and see what happens. And then they'll sort of drop the hammer on when to give the antivirals. It's really important. So it also not just, it doesn't just prevent CMV, it prevents herpes viruses as well, which is a really important some of the other um, side effects that we'll see with this. It reduces all kinds kinds of things like rejection and renal transplant, bronchiolitis obliterans and lung transplants. It's actually really amazing what this will do to prevent the CMV itself. And what's the prophylaxis? Well, we now have several things to choose from. We're no longer stuck with just acyclovir. Gancyclovir is turning out to be a big, important and uh, sort of antiviral in this particular role. It's usually used the first three to six month, months and then tapered if they can. Um, and the duration, if you're, you stay CMV positive and CMV symptomatic, they may actually keep you on this for a long time. So yeah. gancyclovir really is And there's the newer place generations of these, the valgancyclovir, and the, you know, right. they start, you know, so this is not a static target, even in terms, not just your fund of knowledge in terms of the CMV and this uh, post-transplant group, but in terms of the pharmacology, has been fairly rapid. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it is important because there yeah. is a little bit of resistance issue, particularly with acyclovir. So yeah. that that's to stay ahead of that. As far as diagnosing it, our job really is to think about it and make that phone call because they're going to want to do assays and things to sort of figure out how how infected are they, where are they going to go with this. So the reality for us is know it exists. Worry about getting the right. I don't even on know board. what color tube that is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and get on the phone. Get on the phone because CMV is a huge problem in this now. CMV, the other virus that kind of goes along with that to be concerned about is EBV. EBV. And we know EBV is correlated with lymphomas. It just is. It also turns out that it causes a post-transplant lympho lymphoproliferative syndrome, PTLD. Basically, it's a, it's a disease, a syndrome that goes with this. And it's heterogeneous. It's anything from just a lot of lymphadenopathy to true, honest to goodness, aggressive B-cell lymphoma. But most of the time, it's sort of mono-like. Right. Most of the time, it's like mono. But, but I'll tell you, if it, if it actually transforms to truly a malignant phenomenon, it's highly mortal, 40 to 60 percent, which is another reason it'd be nice to prevent these viruses with something like an, an antiviral yep. so that you don't even end up in this particular situation. Tell us start. about the risk factors. Well, the risk factors of these, if, you've, <laughs> primary, if you if you basically have a transplant and, and you basically are seronegative and a seropositive donor who at H e EBV gives you their lungs and you now have that and you had no antibodies at all, you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. Um, CMV co-infection, though, is the other one. And honestly, that's why CMV is so important to focus on because this kind of goes along with CMV and the viral infections. And this list of clinical presentations, Billy and I were laughing earlier, it's sort of Like a seven bit organ of systems, vague as, as can be. Right. I mean, it's the kind of thing, you look at this list, I mean, not, not that FUO isn't, you know, a fever of unknown origin isn't vague enough, but then you got the mono-like thing mm -hmm. and then they can have GI stuff and they can have infiltrative disease and, and central nervous. I'm, you know, I sort of, when I look at this, my thought is I could have studied this paper the night before, I'd still miss it in the emergency room tomorrow. Exactly, which to me, the take home point on this is if, if I have a transplant recipient who's basically having almost any symptoms, including a GI bleed, it's something to, just any transplant recipient, just get on the phone with the people who know more than you do if they're sick at all, because they'll help you. They'll know, oh, GI bleeding. Well, we worry about EBV. So, you know, we'll come in and see the patient or whatever. But it's, it's again, beyond yeah. our 
ability to sort of diagnose these things. The diagnosis is what your specialist is going to tell you, but it is EBV testing. And then the treatment is up to them. Our job is to get antibiotics on board and antivirals if they want them on board. But the rest of that, as far as what they do with immunosuppression, et cetera, et cetera, is completely up to the specialists in this regard, way beyond us. And now we get to the fun and weird viruses. And now we get to the weird viruses, and Billy has little tidbits of information on these. The um, polyoma viruses, BK and JC. And where do BK and JC come from, Billy? So uh, I thought it was Burger King and Jakob Kutzfeld. But apparently but not. But so, so wrong. Um, so I, I had to, you know, I was like, I have never even heard of them, so I had to go fishing. It turns out that BK and JC, in a sort of violation of HIPAA rules, are the initials of the index patients where they sort of hammered down the diagnosis. So they got named for them. Heck of a way to get famous. I'll yeah, tell so you. there you go. So, uh, you know, JC in this case is not the Joint Commission. It's not Jesus Christ. No, it's. Um, it's as a Catholic uh, kid, I had to Joe get that Clark out. Joe Clark. It's not Jakob Kruzfeld. <laughs> Um, whoever it was yeah, that got Yeah, it's Joe this Clark or something like that. Right. So these polyoma yeah. viruses are they were described in these two transplant recipients who got this particular kind of virus that caused two different things. One causes kidney troubles, the other causes brain troubles. And there's really unfortunately not a lot you can do about either of them and honestly this is not something that we will I think ever I love learning about serious <laughs> disorders with no treatment. No treatment. So there's no therapeutic <laughs> options here. It. Yeah. It's just one of the things that they right. that this group of patients get and so you got to kind of know it's in the mix. Um, and they're also fairly, although the, the BK does do the nephropathy thing, mm -hmm. and it's the JC that does the, um, the PTLD thing predominantly, they also have other presentations. The other thing I learned when I was going back to figure out what are these things and sort of s looking around on the web is that actually a lot of people out there in the community have them. If you test for them. But you're, but you're right, not you, immunosuppressed. But you, you're not immunosuppressed. So, you've, you, so you out there listening right now might have BK and JC running around you in could. you. But until you get immunosuppressed, it won't be a problem. Exactly. Now, CNS infection. So, and we just talked about a bunch of things that can cause somebody to have CNS symptoms. It is truly like, it, it's not, this is not rocket science. It is not, it is a medical emergency. Yes, it is. CNS infection in virtually anybody is a medical emergency. And the problem Let with- Let alone the immunocompromised. Right, and then you add the immunocompromised state on that. And then the it could be the JC virus. It could be herpes virus. It could be Listeria, you name it. Our job is to get empiric therapy started up front, which we're actually pretty good at. For I the mean, bacterial stuff. Right. Now we have to be better about the viral, viral stuff. stuff. So and one it, of the take yeah. homes here is yes, you got it. You need to include antivirals. Yeah, in this, and acyclovir is what we would typically do because that would be cover herpes virus. Not too, but not here. Mm -hmm. This is not here. So you need to go up a notch. Mm -hmm. You need to go up a notch with your antiviral right. if you were going right. to do it. Empirically. And it's interesting if you read the paper. That's not exactly stated in this paper. They don't say what to do about this as far as what should your practice be. But in sort of more research behind the scenes, if it's a transplant recipient, you're worried about a CNS infection. It is worth broadening your coverage beyond the antibiotics to include the specific antivirals, the higher end antivirals um, in that particular group Not that while you're doing work your work against BK or JC. Because nothing works against those. <laughs> exactly. Now, pneumocystis, is, pneumocystis kind of got the rage because of HIV. We all got very familiar with pneumocystis, but before HIV hit, pneumocystis was an infection in immunosuppressed people, often organ, tra organ transplant recipients. So pneumonitis and pneumocystis can occur, but this is why Bactrim has been so wonderful. It, suppress yeah. it basically stops this from happening. And the symptoms, we all know what to hook into. Somebody who's really hot, hypoxic, really dyspneic, their x-ray looks pretty normal, they're coughing like crazy. That is, and if they're yeah. immunosuppressed, that is pneumocystis they proven otherwise. They when they get up and take three Steps. Yeah, they barely move that, yeah. and you you've seen these cases, and so just think about that. Rather than niching that just in the HIV box, open the box and put organ transplant recipients as a group. You also worry about this particular infection, um, and sometimes again that X-ray is not terribly helpful. I don't honestly think you have to go on to CT to define the disease. If you see that kind of clinical findings, you're going to worry about pneumocystis, and if they're not on Bactrim, you're going to want to consider treating them for it as well. So if you want to summarize, see those it's a the, yes, that finger. Um, it, four categories of infection that occur in solid organ transplant recipients. Some are from the donor, some are from the recipient, some are from being in the hospital, some are from the community. They have different time frames. They do. The infection is prevented by a lot of things, screening of both the donor and the recipient, vaccination, doing things like washing your hands, and treating things preemptively or even prophylactically, like antivirals and anti um, antibiotics. And then the infections are based on timing. Less than one month, 
Opportunistic infections are rare, but it may be C. diff, viremia, or candidemia. See, I think this is sort of the money slide. The money slide, for exactly. This, for this type Intermediate, of paper. that one to six months. It's viral infections usually. Allograft rejection is to graft rejection is to remember, and then late is greater than six months, and it's usually community acquired at that particular point in time. Their sort of immunosuppression is taper back. One down. One down.